And now the Flyers will pick it up and bring it back. Oh, what a hit by Campbell! Holy mackerel! Campbell stepped into his check in the blue line. Now they're all chasing after Campbell. It's 38 all. Bills can win it here. Wright puts it down. The kick is on the way, and it is good. And the Bills. Tripped up, gets it to May, and over the line, he's May going in on goal, he shoots, he scores! Welcome to another episode of Wagons and Warpaths, your weekly Buffalo Sports Talk podcast, officially sponsored by the Daily Buffalo, officially a contributor to Buffalo Fanatics, officially a part of Project Dits. I am Anthony. I am the host of this podcast. Find me on Twitter at Wagons underscore Warpaths. Go on Twitter. Give me a follow on Twitter. Sign the blood oath. Give me the deed to your house and any and all private bank account information, just basic level social media engagement things. If you like this episode or any episode on this podcast, please rate and review and subscribe. Tell your family and friends and loved ones about this pod. Even tell your enemies. Even tell your cats and dogs because you never know. Maybe sometimes they're doing stuff when you're not around, like listening to podcasts or going on Twitter or doing stuff like that. We are roughly a week and a half, a week and a half away from opening night in the NFL, Thursday, September 10th. And that also means that we are roughly under two weeks away from official 2020 Buffalo Bills regular season football. Sunday, September 13th, the Bills open up against the New York Jets. Hopefully they win. Hopefully they look good. Hopefully the faith and the hope that has been somewhat restored is not pulled out from underneath us like the vicious bitch that it's been for the last God knows how many forsaken years. I'm very excited. Training camp has been officially, officially underway the last couple of weeks with padded practices and drills and one-on-ones and team activities and all of that and people getting COVID tests and rookies coming through, guys getting cut, guys getting signed. And there's been some information that's come out. You can't go too hard with the information or video footage as we've seen guys getting suspended for different things, reporters getting suspended and kicked out of things because of certain things. So we have some access, but not complete access. And with that, there's been a lot of speculation, a lot of talk about positional rankings and battles and, you know, who looks good, who's doing this, who's lining up where, how they're going to form and function and all of that. I didn't want to get into that this week. I've been looking at things from an individual player perspective over the last week or so. Well, really over the last several weeks, but especially over this last week. And really looking at how the Bills season can potentially go this year and what it'll look like going forward after this year. This COVID offseason has changed everything. We don't know what sports are going to look like next year or even the year after, to be honest. We don't know what regular life is going to look like. How often and how long do we have to continue to wear masks for? When will fans be allowed at sporting venues and arenas? When can we go back to having some level of normalcy back in our lives instead of having to adjust to the new normal that we've been going through? Or is the new normal our normal going forward? And so I was starting to think all that. I was thinking about players and who the Bills have this year, who the Bills acquired this year, what the Bills roster has looked like in past years, this year, next year, 2022, 2023, so on and so forth. And as I started to look at things from that individual perspective, I started to really hone in and focus on two players that I am very excited to see this year for the Buffalo Bills, because I think they're going to make a big difference. And I'm also excited to see 
what they're going to look like going forward. You can probably guess who those two players are based on the title of this episode being Quentin Jefferson and Matt Milano, you guys. This episode is going to focus on Josh Allen and Stephon Diggs. Just kidding, it's not. It's going to focus on Quentin Jefferson and Matt Milano. Quentin Jefferson came to the Buffalo Bills this year as a free agent addition from the Seattle Seahawks, and I think his addition was not one that flew under the radar, but I don't know if it was necessarily appreciated enough. Not in a negative way, but it came with a flurry of moves for the Bills, and then and then anything and everything the Bills did this offseason, whether it was free agent acquisitions or draft picks, anything, all of that was dwarfed or overshadowed by the Stephon Diggs trade. So I don't think there was, I think there's been some talk of like, oh, hey, you know, the Bills got this guy. He's like versatile. He comes from Seattle. There's been talk about it. But I don't think he's necessarily gotten the appreciation that he should. And I'm very excited to see what he does in this upcoming year. And then Matt Milano, big time fan favorite in Bills Mafia. He's fantastic. He's great. A lot of the talk this offseason, I've talked about it on several episodes. I've talked about it a lot on Twitter. Matt Milano is an unrestricted free agent in 2021. So what does his contract look like? Is he going to be a Buffalo Bill for life? Or at least another four to six years, something like that. Is he a core member? Is he going to have to go? And a lot of that is going to be based on the play that he exhibits here in 2020. The better Matt Milano plays in 2020, the better the Buffalo Bills defense will be, but also the better he plays, the better the chance that he plays himself out of Buffalo to a big contract. So I wanted to get into that. Thank you for tuning into this episode. Thank you for listening. We're going to start with Quentin Jefferson. Quentin Jefferson, again, comes to the Buffalo Bills from the Seattle Seahawks. I must admit when we got him, I'm familiar with with Quentin Jefferson, as I am with quite a lot in the NFL because I enjoy the hell out of it. The first thing I did when the Bills got Quentin Jefferson was go to the Seahawks Reddit page and Seahawks blogs and things like that. I always like to judge a player's acquisition by how the team he just left, how their fan base reacts to them being lost. I did it for the Sabres when they got Cahoon. Penguins fans were not pleased. And I was familiar with Cahoon, but I mean, I was in the dumps and in the gutter with a lot of things that were going on with the Sabres. So I was like, all right, cool. Let me see what Penns fans say. And Penns fans were not pleased with Cahoon leaving. And I liked the way Cahoon played for the Sabres. I thought it was a cool acquisition. So I'd like to do that for certain things. And when the Bills got Jefferson, Seahawks fans were not happy whatsoever. And that immediately, sorry, Seahawks fans, if there are Seahawks fans listening, that's cool. Welcome to, you know, welcome to the pod. But that warmed my heart and made me feel good. I was like, oh man, they're legitimately not pleased that Quentin Jefferson is gone. I've seen a pretty decent amount of Seahawks games. They're usually a four o'clock focus. They get a lot of prime time love. I've had Chris Carson on my fantasy team the last several years, so I'll put the Seahawks games up on Sunday Ticket. So I am fairly familiar with his work. Not, I wouldn't say more than others, but I see a lot of Seattle games. And so we got Jefferson. I was like, oh, that's cool. And then I saw that Seahawks fans were unhappy, and I was like, that's even better. And then when you really look into the numbers and put things into perspective, so the Bills' defensive line, obviously very important. The Bills play 4-3 defense. They don't blitz a lot. The Bills, last year in 2019, they only blitzed on 31.1% of snaps. So that means on 68.9% of snaps, they were rushing four or less. So 68.9% of the time, the front four was solely responsible for generating pressure. That is something that we know. McDermott and the defense and Leslie Frazier, they love to primarily rush the front four and that's it. And then drop seven. They are a 4-3 front four rushing team. They will show that double A gap blitz. Sometimes they'll bring it. Sometimes they won't. Sometimes they'll leave Milano or Trey in there to kind of spy, maybe delay blitz. But long story short, 31.1% of the time in 2019, the Bills blitzed, which means 68.9% of the time, They were rushing four or less. The front four is tremendously important for the Buffalo Bills in terms of generating pressure, creating hurries, getting to the quarterback, causing chaos. And when you rush 
with your front four primarily, and you don't do a lot of blitzing, and you don't do a lot of scheming. And I don't want to say they don't do a lot of scheming. They do a lot of stunts, and they play games up front, and they do things to add to the havoc because they haven't had anybody up front that's just straight, all right, cool, we don't need to do anything. These guys are going to win one-on-one. They don't have the Giants front four from 2007 or 2011 when you had guys like Strahan and Yuman Yora and Justin Tuck where it was just like, all right, dudes, just line up and beat the man in front of you and get to Tom Brady. Like, they, Bills don't have that. And even if they did, you still need quality depth along that front four because when you're rushing with those dudes and you're also providing run support on every other play that isn't a pass rush, you're going to get winded. You're going to get tired. Dudes get nicked up. Dudes get banged up. Some guys miss games or multiple games because of injuries. Things happen. You need quality up front in your defensive line. You need to be able to rotate guys out. You got your starting front four. You usually need seven quality dudes. If you can get eight, that's awesome. If you can run like two lines, a front four, that's fantastic. So you need quality. You need depth. But also up front, you need versatility. You need guys who can line up at end or defensive tackle, who can provide run support on first and second down, but maybe can line up over the guard or center on third down and beat a man one-on-one or get inside. You need guys who have multiple weapons in their pass rushing and run-stopping arsenal. You need that across the front four. Quentin Jefferson is the epitome of that. When Quentin Jefferson came to the Buffalo Bills, Sean McDermott was quoted as saying, Quentin Jefferson has position flexibility and versatility. And I think that is huge. He played really good snaps for the Seattle Seahawks on a good defense. He's played inside. He's played outside, end quote. And that's backed up with the numbers. In 2019, Quentin Jefferson, his snaps, 27% of his snaps were at left end. 42% of his snaps were at right end. 31% of his snaps were at defensive tackle. The man was all over the defensive line. He's been quoted as saying his position is not defensive end or defensive tackle. His position is defensive line. And it's backed up by the numbers. The man can play anywhere on the front four. He can play at the three tech. He can play at the five. He's very comfortable in both respects. And that is tremendous for the Buffalo Bills. It was tremendous when they acquired him outright during free agency. But it's even more important now, given the opting out of Starla Tulele, the Bills already lost Shaq Lawson and Jordan Phillips to free agency, and then they re-upped with Jefferson and Vernon Butler and Mario Addison and A.J. Epinesa in the draft. But the Bills lost some guys from last year. And then they had Star opt out. Harrison Phillips is coming back from a severe injury. He should be good to go. Hopefully everything is fine. He's showing, you know, no signs that he's worse for wear. But sometimes it takes dudes like that a bit of time to get back to their playing form where they have to adjust to coming back from injury. So the Bills, with Star opting out, Shaq leaving via free agency, Jordan Phillips leaving via free agency, they're out three guys who played a lot of snaps last year. They're out three guys who were staples on that front four. And then you got Harrison Phillips coming back. So the defensive line is different. Much different than it was last year, but I think it's better. And part of that reason why I think it's better, again, the additions, Jefferson, Addison, Butler, Epinesa. But Quentin Jefferson is the one that I don't want to say I'm the most intrigued about because I want to see what Mario Addison does off the edge. I want to see if he can continue to get 9 to 10 sacks a year. I want to see what Butler looks like. Vernon Butler also represents not, I don't want to say tremendous versatility, but pretty solid positional versatility and flexibility up front almost as good as Jefferson. I really want to see what A.J. Epinesa looks like coming out of Iowa. I loved watching him at Iowa, and the fact that he fell so far in the second round, I'm really excited to see what he can be. But in staying on Jefferson, he's already got the proven NFL experience at multiple positions along the front four. Again, being able to play almost 30% at every single position on the defensive line is fantastic. And he was successful at it. Even if you just take it from the defensive tackle perspective. He had 39 pressures on 401 pass rushes in 2019. For reference, Jordan Phillips, who was a standout for the Buffalo Bills, 
He had 38 pressures on 548 pass rushes over the last two years combined. So Phillips had 38 pressures, 548 pass rushes. Jefferson had 39 pressures on 401 pass rushes. He had one more pressure on 137 less pass rushes than Jordan Phillips. Also in 2019, Quentin Jefferson was a top five pass rush win rate player when lined up as a defensive tackle in 2019. Pass rush win rate is literally what it says. How often was he winning in his matchup when he was pass rushing? What is the rate? What is the percentage based out of all the snaps that he took? He was fifth in the entire NFL when lined up at defensive tackle, only behind Aaron Donald, who was first with a pass rush win rate of 24%, Grady Jarrett, who was second, at 22%, Chris Jones, who was third with 19%, and then Jefferson was tied at fourth, but fifth, technically, depending on how you want to look at the tie. He was tied with Malik Collins, who was at 16%. Quentin Jefferson was top five in the NFL in defensive tackle, pass rush win rate, and the only people he was behind are awesome. Aaron Donald is arguably the best football player in the entire NFL. Not best defensive tackle, not best defensive lineman, not best defender. He's arguably the best football player in the NFL. He's immaculate. Grady Jarrett, tremendous. Chris Jones, tremendous. Malik Collins, very underrated, also very good. Quentin Jefferson's name is in line with those guys. Also, fun fact, seventh on that list is Ed Oliver, so that's pretty awesome. Quentin Jefferson is a tremendous addition for the Buffalo Bills. His positional versatility and flexibility and the success that he's had at those spots. Being able to take a guy and being able to line him up at defensive tackle, especially in a year where the Bills don't have Starla Tulele anymore, is tremendous. Then also having a guy that you can pop out to the outside, we know what the Bills like to do on third down. Lorenzo Alexander, they used to kick him down on the defensive line, sometimes line him up inside for a little bit of a NASCAR speed rush package. Lorenzo Alexander is another guy who is gone. You have guys who were prominent pass rush, third down pass rush guys, but just rotational pieces on the defensive line. Alexander more on third down packages, but there is no Zoe, there is no Shaq, there is no Jordan Phillips, and there is no star. So you need the acquisitions that you brought in this offseason to step up, which is expected. You lose dudes, you bring new dudes in, you got to hope that they do the job. Quentin Jefferson can do the job. And not only do I think he can do the job, I think he's an upgrade versus what the Bills had last year. That top five pass rush win rate ability, that stat, is a tremendous stat. He was top five in pass rush win rate from the defensive tackle spot. And the only guys he was behind are awesome NFL players, established household names. If you guessed who the top five were, most people are going to be like, okay, Aaron Donald, Chris Jones will get mentioned there, especially after how he performed for the Chiefs in their Super Bowl run. Grady Jarrett's going to get up there. You're not going to name Quentin Jefferson. You're not going to. Most of the talk around the Seattle defensive line last year was, and I guess rightfully so because he's a household name, Jadavion Clowney. But Jefferson was the best guy on that front four last year. Jefferson was the guy that Seattle fans were most upset about losing. And Quentin Jefferson is, I'm not going to say he's my favorite acquisition of the offseason, because Stephon Diggs is amazing. Top 8-12 to wide receiver, arguably the best route runner. Awesome. I also really, 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 really love AJ Epinesa. I also like Zach Moss. I like a lot of things the Bills did. So I can't say it's my favorite. It's too tough. Also, I haven't thought about it. I need to give it some thought. I like to really think with things. But it's a tremendous acquisition. And I don't think it's being talked about enough. It's been talked about some, but I don't think it's been talked about enough. I think Quentin Jefferson is a guy that when we're sitting here at this time next year or at the end of this year or in the 2021 offseason after the 2020 season is finished, we're going to look back and say, damn, Quentin Jefferson was arguably one of the best players on our defense last year. I think he's going to have that kind of impact, and his numbers back it up. His ability backs it up, and he allows for that front four 
to do so many things. He can spell so many guys on that front four. He can offer so much role functionality in different situations and in different keys. And again, when you are a team that only blitzes 31% of the time, you need your front four to be able to scheme and play games and win matchups. If you're rushing four, at least you got five guys blocking four. There's five offensive linemen, at least, to block that front four. That means you got one-on-one matchups. At at least somebody, one person, two person, three people, are usually going to get some kind of one-on-one matchup. Maybe you got a tight end who chips. Maybe you got a running back who chips. But for the most part, you're going to, somebody's getting a one-on-one matchup. Having guys that can win in a pass rush situation like Quentin Jefferson can, cannot be overstated for today's NFL, especially as I've been banging the drum for all year. You're trying to get to the Super Bowl. That's the goal. We're not just being like, well, we want to win a game. The goal is championship now. That means you got to beat the Chiefs. That means you got to beat the Ravens. And if you're beating the Chiefs, you got to fuck up Patrick Mahomes. And the only way to do that is to cover on the back end and rush the shit out of him up front. You got to do that. And Quentin Jefferson, that acquisition, based on everything I've said, was a good acquisition. And I'm excited to see what he does. So that was Quentin Jefferson, you guys. And then based on this episode, next up would be Matt Milano. You guys, I love Matt Milano. He's arguably my favorite Buffalo Bills player. I love his story. I liked him at Boston College. I was excited when the Bills drafted him. I thought he could be something. And lo and behold, he has become something. Matt Milano. Over the last two years, Matt Milano has an 86.8 coverage grade behind only Levante David, Corey Littleton, and Luke Keekley. In the last two years, Matt Milano has the fourth best coverage grade amongst linebackers in the entire NFL. That is tremendous. Matt Milano is one of the best linebackers in coverage in the NFL. And in today's NFL, where you pass a lot and you throw a lot and you got to beat the Chiefs and you still got to beat Tom Brady and you got to beat the Saints and you got to beat the Ravens, you need to be able to have versatility and you need to be able to cover. And Matt Milano is great at coverage. And it's even more important, considering the Bills play nickel, with their base defense is a 4-3, but their real base defense is a nickel defense. They play nickel D 77% of the time. That's what they did in 2019. Third most in the NFL. They're a nickel a lot. And when you're a nickel a lot, that means your two linebackers need to be able to cover. Because if they cover like they got their feet stuck in cement, or they have non-fluid hips, or they can't read coverage, or they can't funnel, or they can't function and flow sideline to sideline, you're dead in the water, and you can't compete with the teams that are winning in today's NFL. Matt Milano does a lot on this Bills defense. And again, 86.8 coverage grade over the last two years, fourth in the NFL amongst linebackers. That's fucking awesome. Unfortunately, in 2019, he led the Bills in missed tackles with 16. Matt Milano, for as athletic as he is and as aggressive as he is and as fast and as explosive as he is, at times, he plays out of himself. Sometimes he gets locked up in that athleticism. Sometimes he plays a little bit out of control, doesn't break down, doesn't come with technique, doesn't come with form, and he can get caught out of position when he's going in for tackles or he's going in for run fits, and that's why he had those missed tackles last year. That's why he led the Bills. Despite that, I don't think... I don't think he's a bad tackler. I think Matt Milano is very good. And I'm excited to see what he does this year. And I'm excited to see what he does this year almost as much as I am intrigued to see what he does this year. Because as I mentioned in the lead-in, Matt Milano, going into next year, he is an unrestricted free agent. The Buffalo Bills are starting to come up on a time that I never thought I would see in all my years as a Bills fan. I didn't know when the time would come where you suddenly have to start re-signing your core players because you have a good team and you suddenly have a core. We've seen that with teams all over the place. The Baltimore Ravens are a good example, and they really started to hit on all cylinders around the Flacco years. You suddenly had like Ray Lewis and Ed Reed and Terrell Suggs and Bart Scott and Adalis Thomas and all these guys that it was like, okay, well, we can't pay Thomas. He's gone, going to the past. We can't pay Bart Scott. 
He's going to the Jets. All right, we can't pay Pernell McPhee. He's going to go to the Bears. All these guys who you suddenly have that have emerged, but you can't pay them because your core is Ed Reed and Ray Lewis and Terrell Suggs, and that's where your money is. The Bills are coming in now on a time where they have to establish who and what their core is going to be. They've already made one move towards that, and that was signing Deion Dawkins. Well, re-signing him, re-upping him, extending his contract, which was a good move. What's also going to happen over the next coming years, next year, Tredavious White is going to get a new deal. He's probably going to reset the corner market. He's tremendous, arguably the best corner in the NFL, at worst, top two, top three, all pro. He's great. He needs a new deal. He is going to be a Buffalo Bill for life, or should be. He needs a new deal. Also looming on the horizon will be deals that Tremaine Edmonds will hopefully need, most likely need, because he's... Still very young, still growing and learning. And I don't mean just growing in terms of like what he knows in the game. I mean growing physically because he's still a child, but he's in the size and body of Godzilla because he's a monster. Tremaine Edmonds is going to need a new deal. Josh Allen, hopefully, as the franchise quarterback and leader of this team for the future, he is going to need a new deal. Quarterbacks get paid in today's NFL. Tremaine Edmonds is going to get paid. Travis White is going to get paid. Deion Dawkins got paid. A hefty contract now, but as tackles start to get paid over the next couple of years, it's going to be, it's going to not look as bad. He's going to be in the top 15 in a couple of years, but maybe even closer to top 10 when all these other dudes get paid. I broke that down in another episode. Feel free to go back and check out the catalog because all my episodes are fucking great. But anyway, back to Matt Milano and back to contract things. Tremaine Edmonds is going to get a big deal too. The trades are going to get paid. White's deal might make him the highest paid corner in the NFL. Tremaine Edmonds could get a deal that might push push him into the top five in terms of paid linebackers. He's going to get paid, paid. Josh Allen, we'll see what he's going to get. But long story short, there are guys that are established members of this core who are going to get paid. I love Milano, but he does not trump Tredavious White. He does not trump Josh Allen. He does not trump Tremaine Edmonds. Those guys are the established core. So you have to start to look at Matt Milano and his play and his production and his value. And if you're the Bills and Brandon Bean and Sean McDermott and think, is he a part of that core? For me, I think he needs to be. In today's NFL, your pass coverage needs to be on point. And I want the core of that defense to be Tredavious White, Micah Hyde, Jordan Poyer, Tremaine Edmonds, Matt Milano. Those five. Especially with how much the Bills play nickel. Milano and Edmonds see a lot of field a lot of the time. They don't come off the field. Knock on wood, unless they get hurt. I'm literally knocking. You can't hear it, but as my bio says on Twitter, I'm not superstitious, but I am a little stitious. That's a joke from the office. In actuality, I am very superstitious. They are on the field a lot. They do a lot. They run fit on first down, they shed blocks on first and second, and they cover their asses off on third, especially Milano, whose numbers I just spoke about. I think Milano is very important for the success of the Bills' defense going forward. I also think his support in the run game, his blitzing ability, and his tackling, I don't want to say is underrated, but I think it's also good. I think he could have a year this year, especially if he shores up the tackling, Matt Milano could have a year where people are talking about him being one of the top 10 linebackers in the NFL, which is awesome for the Bills. That means he had a great year, and the Bills' defense killed it. But again, that means he's going to get paid. And you have to decide, is he going to be a core member of the team, or is he not? And what's worrisome, and why you have to make that decision and split hairs even more than you normally did, 2021, the salary cap, due to COVID and everything that's happened this year, is going to be reduced. Originally, we were looking at the 2021 salary cap being estimated around $210 million. The 2020 cap is 198.2, so the estimation was 2021 would be 210 Now there's talks that it could be around 175 If the NFL revenue is better than expected, the cap could go up, i.e. if the NFL can get fans in attendance and make some more money, the salary cap could go up. But long story short... There's going to be a reduced cap next year in some form or fashion. It's not going to be 210. It's going to be around 175. Could be 180, maybe 185. But either way, when you look at it, it's going to be tough for the Bills to sign Milano, especially with the deal that Dawkins just got, especially with the deal that Trey's going to need, 
especially with the deals that Edmonds and Allen are going to need that are looming on the horizon. Guys that you have to pay. And I want Milano to get paid, but it's going to be tough. As of right now, his average annual value, as calculated by SpotTrack, is $13 million a year on a new deal. His base calculated value for a deal in 2021 is six years, $77.5 million. That has an average annual value of 12.9. But his calculated market value, when you compare him to other players of a similar nature, age, and production level, his calculated market value is four years, $52 million. That's an average annual value of 13.004. So again, long story short, in conclusion, whatever summation phrase you want to use, his average annual value is around 13 mil a year. Zach Cunningham, linebacker for the Houston Texans, inside linebacker, sometimes billed as an outside linebacker, but a linebacker nonetheless. He just signed a new deal today worth $14.5 million in new money. So if he's getting that, Milano's going to get paid. And when you start to look at things for Milano, again, on SpotTrack, SpotTrack is fantastic, awesome salary cap analysis, awesome market value analysis. And when you base that on statistical comparisons to other players based on age, contract status, and statistical production, you get comparisons to other good players in the NFL at the linebacker position. On spot track, again, where I went for this info, where I love to go, they are tremendous when it comes to salary cap analysis and market valuation for NFL players. The players Matt Milano is compared to For market value are Jalen Smith of the Dallas Cowboys, Anthony Barr of the Minnesota Vikings, who is actually a very good linebacker when he's not being jumped over by quarterbacks, Shaq Thompson of the Carolina Panthers, and Quan Alexander, formerly of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, now of the San Francisco 49ers. All four of those linebackers are very, very good. Jalen Smith is fantastic. If he didn't have that knee injury in the bowl game for Notre Dame, He could have been a top 10 pick, maybe even top five. And even coming back from that devastatingly gruesome and horrific injury, he has still risen to be one of the best linebackers in the NFL. He's great. Anthony Barr, all jokes aside, very, very, very good linebacker for the Minnesota Vikings. Shaq Thompson, very, very, very good linebacker for the Carolina Panthers. Quan Alexander is a monster for the 49ers. I don't know how Tampa decided that he could go away. But he is fantastic. All of these guys that Milano is compared to, it's a tremendous comparison. He is in a tremendously talented grouping when you're comparing things from market value. He's in a good class. He's in good company. That's awesome for him. Less ideal for Bills fans. Because again, that means he's going to get paid. And when you compare him with statistical comparison and market value and money, again, to Jalen Smith, Anthony Barr, Shaq Thompson, Quan Alexander... The things you start to break down, what spot track breaks down for market value are percentage of games played, tackles per game, sacks per game, stops per game, coverage, catch percentage, hurries, and overall rating. Out of those players that he is compared to, again, those four, including him, there's five players in comparison here. He's second in tackles per game, fourth in sacks per game, second in stops per game, first in in coverage catch percentage, second in hurries, and third in overall rating. So in the company of other very good peers of his, Milano definitely holds his own. He is in that class. He is fantastic. I mentioned stops, and for reference, just in case those of you don't know, a stop is defined as a play where a defender makes a tackle and the location of said tackle makes the play unsuccessful for the offense and a successful one for the defense. To break it down further, you get a stop on first down if the offense gets 45% of the way to the first down or less. You get a stop on second down if the offense gets 60% of the way to the first down or less. Third or fourth down, you get a stop if the offense does not get a first down. I love that stat. I think it's tremendous. It really puts things into perspective. So if you have a guy who gets a lot of tackles, but he gets a lot of tackles because he gets beat in coverage and then makes a tackle, it's good that he made the tackle, but he's getting beat. If you got a third and three and you got a guy who makes a tackle for a one-yard gain and stops him on third down, that's a much better tackle than a guy who makes the tackle six yards downfield, makes the tackle, but gives up the first down. I love stops. That's fantastic. So in that grouping, he was second 
in stops. And a little fun fact, if you take the NFL average for linebackers, the NFL linebacker averages 2.44 stops per game. Milano, from 2018 to 2019, averages 2.79 stops per game. Another fun fact within that is the coverage catch percentage. So again, the percentage of catches that the player gives up when they are in coverage. The NFL average for linebackers is 82.45. Milano, according to Spot Track, his coverage catch percentage is 69.4, roughly 13 percentage points lower. Matt Milano, long story short, again, is fantastic, is very good, is tremendous in coverage. Depending on the year that he has, he is going to get paid big time. It's just a matter of how paid that he gets. Right now, again, average annual value is calculated to be $13 million a year. If he has the year that he's capable of having, if he shores up his tackling and continues to be the coverage monster that he is, he could see a contract up to 15 or 16 mil a year. Or maybe up that floor to $14 million. He's going to get paid. And the Bills are going to be faced with a tough decision. Fortunately for them, Brandon Bean is a fantastic wizard, literal wizard, cap wizard, scouting wizard, wizard of all kinds, went to Hogwarts, graduated top of his class, awesome results on his owls and in his potions classes, all that kind of stuff. Played Quidditch, tremendous wizard. Deion Dawkins' contract was structured in a way that the cap hit in 2021 is not bad. It could be a lot worse. Also, with the cutting of Steven Hauschka, poor one out for Hausch. I love Hausch money. He did very well for us in his time. I wish him all the best wherever he goes. But if he signs with the Titans, I hope he doesn't do well. Sorry, Hausch. I don't like the Titans or their jacked up fan base. No, thank you. Cutting him and the money that we save from him next year and this year, and then we can roll over in addition to the other money that the Bills are able to roll over, it means they have a chance. So Milano could be locked up. But again, now is where the serious analysis has to begin. And what do you value? And I think, to me, the Buffalo Bills should value Matt Milano. I think he makes their defense so much better. We spoke about Quentin Jefferson, and that's part of the reason why I wanted to talk about these two guys in the same episode. Quentin Jefferson, I mean, right now it's all speculation, but we will see as the season progresses. Quentin Jefferson allows the Bills front four so much flexibility and versatility. And by extension, he allows the defense flexibility and versatility. And I think Milano does that same thing from the linebacking court. But Milano's is even more important because as much as I love Quentin Jefferson, the Bills' defensive line is deep. I don't think they have a stud, although Ed Oliver could potentially be that. So could Epinesa to a degree. But the Bills don't have ballers up front. They've got a good, solid group where everyone is pretty much a B plus to a B minus, maybe an A minus to a B, some kind of thing in that range. They have a bunch of very much above average players. They don't have a stud, but they've got good dudes, solid grouping. The Bills linebacking core is not that. I like AJ Klein. I think he's an underrated sign. I like what he does a lot. But the Bills linebacking core is pretty much Edmonds and Milano and then everyone else. And Edmonds and Milano are... A players, or an A and a B plus, or maybe even two B pluses. Everybody else is like a C plus or below. They are not a tremendously strong grouping. And even if they were, that doesn't take anything away from Milano. Milano is still great. But his functionality in that defense is even more important because there's not a lot of depth or talent behind him. And then when you take what he's done on the field, again, in today's NFL, with so much passing, you get sliced up in today's NFL because the rules are so skewed towards favoring the offense and favoring the passing game and just favoring the offense in general where you can't touch anybody or look at anybody wrong or tackle anybody wrong. It's so important to have good defenders. And it's hard to be good in coverage in any spot on defense, but especially from the linebacker position. And Matt Milano is great at that. And that's not an exaggeration. He's great in coverage. He could be better in run support and tackling, but he's still good at those things. He could just be better. And if he is better this year, if he reaches the capability and fulfills the capacity that he has, he's going to cash in next offseason. And I hope he cashes in with the Buffalo Bills, but it's going to be tough, 
the salary cap restrictions next year and what the Bills have to do and who they have to re-up and re-sign, it's not going to be easy for Milano to get a deal. But that's why I have even more focus on him this year because I want to see I want to see him do good so that he plays well and so the Bills' defense plays well. But I almost don't want him to do too good because I don't want him to play so well that he plays himself out of our price range. But I trust in Bean. I trust in McDermott to make the right call, whether that's sign him or not let him go. They've they've earned some rope with me. They've earned stripes in what they've done so far. I trust what they got going on. But it's going to be interesting. Quentin Jefferson and Matt Milano are two pieces that I am very much looking forward to seeing this year for the Buffalo Bills. And in different capacities, Matt Milano is a guy, again, knock on wood, who should be on the field 95% of the time, 97, 98, maybe even higher. He's going to see the field all the time. Jefferson is going to be more rotational because that defensive line is going to rotate. But I think they're both going to make impacts in their own respective forms and fashions. And I think when we look back on this offseason, we're going to talk about, man, Stephon Diggs, awesome trade, so glad that we got him. But I think right up there with him, like a 1B to Stephon Diggs' 1A is going to be Quentin Jefferson. I think he's going to surprise a lot of fans, a lot of players in this league, and a lot of pundits and analysts with how well he does for the Buffalo Bills. He fits our scheme and our setup so well. He knows it. McDermott knows it. Bean knows it. And soon we'll all know it. I hope. I really, 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 really hope. And Matt Milano, stud, has done very well in his time in the NFL. We're going to see how good he does this year. This time he's not coming off an injury like he was starting the year in 2019, coming off of 2018. He knows what he needs to improve on. He talked about the missed tackles in the playoff game against the Texans. And when you've got a guy who is a fifth-round pick who has played himself into a very, very, very quality NFL starter, you know it's a guy who is committed to his craft and who knows how to put the work in to get better. I believe he put that work in this offseason, and I think we're going to see a much better tackler in Matt Milano this year. And when you pair that with his awesome coverage ability, you're going to have a great all-around linebacker. And that's going to be exciting to see, and it's going to help this defense. And we're going to see what kind of contract it leads him to in 2021. And that has been Quentin Jefferson and Matt Milano, you guys. I hope you like this episode. Thank you for riding with me again on another episode of Wagons and Warpaths. If you like this episode, please rate and review and subscribe to the pod. Please give me a follow on Twitter. I am on the Twitter a pretty decent amount of time, mainly nights. I don't tweet during the day job. I set tweets to go out. That's an awesome function that you can do from your laptop. So I set things to go out during the day, but I'm not really active on it until the late afternoon slash evening time on a daily basis, but I am on the Twitter. Feel free to at me, tweet at me, DM, comment on things, like things. Again, basic stuff, D Deer House, bank account information, social security, that's another cool thing too. If you don't want to give me a follow, but you'd rather just give me your social security number and all your you know address information and things like that, that's also acceptable. I appreciate any and all forms of support and appreciation, and I appreciate you riding with me again on this episode. Please Stay safe. I hope you and your family and friends and loved ones all stay safe. And when I speak to you next week, we will be a week away from Buffalo Bills regular season football. Knock on wood. And that's a very, very, very exciting thing. Thank you again. I'll see you next week.